So what's happened to that twat David Cameron oh. who called it on? <laughs> Let's be fair. Oh. I think what? you're referring no, to no, our no, former no, prime no, minister. No. Yeah, but why the, how comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he has no regrets. Where's, he, where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters <laughs> up. Yeah. Where is the geezer? David Cameron. The answer to the question, what would it look like if Pee Wee Herman banged a Teletubby? He's a former Prime Minister who disappeared under mysterious circumstances back in 2016, but he's back. He took a short break from ruining the country to do business stuff that I'm sure won't come up again, and now he can resume his work being about as useful as a condom machine in the Vatican. As usual, we're going to take a look at the life and times of David William Donald Cameron, now Baron Cameron of Chipping Norton, in an effort to understand just why our country's fetish for smarmy Etonian cunts rivals David's own fetish for fucking pigs. David was born in the cold, hard streets of Marlborough. You might see it being described as an indie chic residential area with a distinct village feel, but beneath that boutique lined exterior, I can assure you, these ends make This Is England look like Pride and Prejudice. He spent most of his years being raised in Peasmore by his mother and father. Father was a multi millionaire stockbroker, and mother was a Justice of the Peace, cool job title, and also daughter of Sir William Mount, the former Conservative Prime Minister. I don't think there's anything more to note about his family history, let me just check my notes. Oh yeah, he's a descendant of King William IV and a distant cousin to Queen Elizabeth II. Apart from that, standard humble upbringings we've come to expect from our ministers. David attended both Heatherdown School and later Eton College. I know these are both private schools, but in fairness, at 50 grand a year you can't really afford not to go, can you? In what I can only describe as one of the least self-aware moments I've ever seen, David recounts in his 2019 memoir how Heatherdown was an austere place to be, and that he lost a stone during a single term because the food was that bad. I suppose you can look on the bright side though, Dave. At least you got school dinners, unlike the hundreds of thousands of children living in poverty right now because of funding cuts you personally oversaw, you absolute cock. After graduating from Eton, David took a gap year. He worked for Conservative MP slash his own godfather Tim Rathbone, which definitely wasn't nepotistic because as we all know, it's not who you know, it's what you know, or something. He then got a job in Hong Kong for a company called Jardine Maths and Holdings at the arrangement of his father, who was an old friend and stockbroker to the then chairman. When he returned, he studied philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford. I'm sure such a distinguished education in one of the best schools in the world would help him make really good economic and moral decisions. While at Oxford, David was a member of the Bullingdon Club, previously described as basically a criminal come dine with me for posh cunts, alongside mop-headed sex addict Boris Johnson. His political career began with him working for the Conservative Research Department between 1988 and 1993. During this time, he was seconded to Downing Street to brief the then Prime Minister John Major for PMQs. After putting in the hours as a strategist for the 1992 general election, David was promoted to special advisor to the Chancellor, Norman Lamont. It wasn't long until he was approved to be a prospective parliamentary candidate for the Conservatives. In 1996, he was selected to run as the candidate for Stafford. He lost the election, and in 2001 tried to find himself a seat he could actually win. He was chosen to represent the gorgeous bastards in Whitney, and won with 45% of the vote. Forgive my wanting to skip through the boring shit a little bit, but for those who cherish the details, here's the rest of the highlights. He joined a select committee, he endorsed Ian Duncan Smith for Tory leader. Ian Duncan Smith became Tory leader. In 2003 he was appointed Shadow Minister in the Privy Council Office as a deputy to the Shadow Leader of the House. In 2004 he became the Vice Chairman of the Conservative Party. And in 2005 he threw his hat into the ring for Leader of the Conservatives. If you think that abridged synopsis was boring, imagine actually fucking reading through it. Fuck me. So, David raced, and with the support of potential human George Osborne, Hello. he became the leader of the Conservative Party. During his election campaign, he presented himself as the young, fresh face that would modernise the Conservative Party, promising mainly to cut public spending and hold a referendum on the EU. Before I go any further, I'm going to take a second to thank Zbiotics, the sponsor of today's video. Look, we all like to go out for drinks with friends, don't we? But the sad truth is, we normally have to get up the next day and, you know, be productive. It sucks. Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. 
It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotic's pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it the most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best the next day. Luckily for me, I got a chance to test them out on a night in Coventry of all places, and it worked an absolute treat. I drank the bottle before I went out, and the next day, I felt totally fine. I got up, treated myself to the most gourmet spoons breakfast, and made the trip back down south as fresh as a daisy. So this holiday season, give your friends and family the gift of a better tomorrow with Zbiotics. You can go to zbiotics.com forward slash geezer or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use geezer at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code, so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this video. On to the 2010 general election. The Conservatives were 20 seats short of a majority and needed help, so they formed a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats under Nick Clegg. 2010 also marked the beginning of austerity in Britain. Before we move on, it's probably worth a quick rundown of what that actually means. The term austerity describes an economic policy in which the government either reduces how much it spends, increases taxes, or some mix of both, with the goal of reducing the national debt. Now, it was clear that, post-financial crisis, there would need to be some amount of public spending cuts, regardless of which party was in government. Alistair Darling, the Chancellor during the Labour government, had planned to reduce the national debt by doing two things. Reducing public spending and, generally, increasing the taxes on the top 5% of earners in the country. While this did include a level of public spending cuts, it was offset by the tax increase on the most prosperous. When David Cameron took office, he and his Chancellor George Osborne decided to scrap that tax increase. George Osborne also made it clear that he was interested in reducing the national debt more aggressively than the previous Labour government budgeted by Alistair Darling. This meant that not only would public services get hit with a much bigger bill thanks to the lack of taxation on high earners, but also that the effects would be much more acute than previously expected. This is really the crux of why so many people despise David Cameron to this day. His choice to cut the national debt so quickly and so one-dimensionally was far too aggressive and held no regard for the impact on the quality of life for those who rely on those services. The sick, the elderly, the disabled, the unemployed would all be disproportionately affected, but hey, they probably didn't vote Conservative in the first place, so fuck them, right? The huge economic disruption we've witnessed since 2010 was brought on really by two things. Arrogance and ignorance. Arrogance, because we can assume that David understood that, bear with my technical lingo here, the financial crisis was bad for money. Now, you'd think this might sway a normal person to not hold a referendum on whether we should remain a part of the EU, also known as the largest trading bloc and second largest economy in the world. You might understand that further financial disruption could be disastrous as we were taking steps to recover from the greatest recession since World War II. The truth is that Dave probably understood this too. He either didn't care or was actually arrogant enough to think that he couldn't possibly lose. He did what just about every Prime Minister since has done, and he put his own career and party politics ahead of what the country actually needed. He didn't care about cuts to public services. Why would he? He's a multi-millionaire living in a gated community with a permanent police presence. What he wanted was a decisive win over the Eurosceptic movement growing in his party, and he was utterly blasé about gambling the future of the nation to get his way. Secondly, ignorance, because he didn't realise that the six years of severe austerity cuts he had enacted meant that there was a groundswell of people deeply frustrated with our political system. 
As the cuts worsened regional inequalities, the divide between our centralised political and upper classes in London and those suffering the most was becoming more and more apparent. David had already cut the top rate of income tax, placing the burden of reducing the national debt on the poorest who rely on social programmes, benefits and public services to live their lives. Despite this, David Cameron thought now was as good a time as any to hold an EU referendum, just whatever it takes to get that wing of his party to just shut up about the EU for a little while. And so, the country campaigned. On one hand, you had people who had financially fisted you for the last six years, telling you that you should listen to them because, honestly, we really understand the importance of money. You had young, fresh-faced liberal students, fresh off their gap year, shouting about how brilliant unrestricted travel through Europe is to 50-year-old struggling fishermen from Grimsby, and wondering why their message wasn't quite landing. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you had Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, and others who, despite being a similar breed of smarmy, posh prick, had presented themselves as the classic English pub-dwelling, pint-drinking lads with an emotive argument that spoke to the struggles people had endured. The NHS is struggling? Well, it's because of all these bloody immigrants, you see. If we leave the EU, we'll gain control of the borders again, which means less people using the NHS. Not to mention the extra £350 million a week that we'll get back. After years of being beaten down with austerity policies, all the Leave campaign needed was one simple slogan. Take back control. Truth is, I don't think half the people that voted Leave were doing so because they genuinely disagreed with our relationship with the EU. I think there were a large amount of people who were just totally disenfranchised by our serving government. After years of cuts that made their lives measurably worse off, they were given a simple choice. Vote to keep going down the road that you're on, or turn off at the next exit and just hope that the next road is more fruitful. So, Britain had voted to leave the EU. After Cameron had not only enacted one of the most vicious austerity programmes Britain has ever seen, but he also removed us from the strongest economy outside of America. I know what you're thinking, boy, he really needs to get his shit together and fix this mess. And so, he did. The following day, he arranged for a team of legal experts and economists to gather at Downing Street so he could begin drafting a thorough and comprehensive trade deal to protect the- only joking, he resigned. Straight up just fucked off and left his cabinet and his country in the lurch. Zero accountability, zero consequences. While the country certainly held a grudge against the man who brought upon the UK two of its last three disasters, David slipped into relative obscurity. But don't worry, now he's back. After Rishi Sunak and Suella Braverman's good cock, bad cock routine started to kind of sort of undermine his government, he had no choice but to reshuffle his cabinet. In what I imagine was a meeting involving lots of Bibles, holy water and head spinning, he eventually exercised, I mean fired Suella, moved James Cleverly into her old seat, and David Cameron returned as Foreign Secretary. As the news broke, most of us rightly wondered whether this was Rishi just playing Tinker Tailor Soldier Cunt, but I can confirm now that our worst fears have been realised. In the days after the announcement, there was one question on everyone's lips. How could David return to the cabinet? He's not even an MP after all. Well, apparently our Prime Ministers have something called the power of patronage. This constitutional convention allows Rishi to employ just about anyone he wants into his cabinet, although it is extremely irregular for one to appoint somebody outside of the Houses of Parliament. In order to remain comfortably within these conventions, Rishi gave David an immediate peerage into the House of Lords. David was made Baron Cameron of Chipping Norton, and hey presto, he could start work as Foreign Secretary immediately. It also means that he will now sit on the Conservative benches in the House of Lords for life. As you can imagine, this news has been welcomed by most with the cheeriness and splendour of a post-anal guff. Not least because of the fact that, since he's not a member of the House of Commons, he will not take part in monthly Foreign Office questions in the House of Commons. This creates a barrier between the MPs we elect being able to ask pointed questions to one of the most important members of our government. 
The second and perhaps most poignant question is what in the tits has David been doing since 2016? Before we really get into it, let me explain that it's common practice in situations where somebody returns to politics for them to disclose exactly what they did in the interim. In David's case, the Foreign Office has refused to say what previous positions David held, and due to his appointment to the Lords rather than the Commons, we really get to see just how murky the waters are in the unelected offices of our government. David announced upon taking office that he would be resigning from all business roles, but hasn't specified exactly what those roles were. Here's what little we do know. In 2020, during Covid, David lobbied ministers to allow a company called Greensill Capital to join a scheme called the Corporate Covid Financing Facility. Let's call it the CCFF. Membership within the CCFF would have allowed Greensill Capital to issue government-insured loans to firms struggling during the pandemic. David was employed as an advisor to Greensill two years before he lobbied for them, and is thought to have made a total of £7 million between his $1 million a year salary, along with selling his shares before the company collapsed in 2021. During his lobbying effort, he and his colleagues were found to have sent 62 messages on behalf of Greensill to various politicians and civil servants. This form of relentless lobbying is not unfamiliar to David, who, back in the early 2000s, was a non-executive director at Erbium PLC. Erbium, the owners of the chain of shithole bars Tiger Tiger, would hound local authorities regularly in order to get a license to sell alcohol past 3am. It's worth mentioning that the lobbying wasn't direct rule-breaking on his part, but only because the rules surrounding lobbying are so absolutely piss-poor to begin with. I should also say that, in 2019, David arranged for the founder of Greensill to meet Health Secretary Matt Hancock in private. Some NHS trusts later went on to use Greensill Capital's services. Now, we may never know what happened in that meeting, but one thing's for sure. Matt Hancock is still a prick. In 2021, David was in another lobbying row after US biotech company Illumina secured a £123 million contract with the Department of Health and Social Care without competition. This contract was secured after David, who was employed as an advisor, strongly encouraged Health Secretary Matt Hancock to attend a conference with the Executive Chairman, Jay Flatley. Now, we may never know what happened in that conference, but one thing's for sure. Matt Hancock really is a fucking prick. In January 2023, he taught politics at New York University, comma, in Abu Dhabi. Just a few years ago, David spoke at two investment events on behalf of the Chinese-funded Belt and Road Initiative. Former Tory leader Ian Duncan Smith said that Cameron, of all people, must understand that this initiative was ultimately about China gaining control and that he hopes he will reconsider his position on representing their interests. You can see then how his lack of transparency, along with close relations with China and the Middle East, might concern those who are sceptical about his return to politics. The truth is, we have basically no idea what he's been doing for the last seven years, and he has no requirement at all to disclose it. While Rishi has mentioned once or twice that David's unrivaled experience would help Britain navigate an uncertain world, when asked by Labour MP Kevin Brennan what specifically was Rishi's favourite example of David's many great foreign policy decisions, his pathetic spineless carcass couldn't cough up a single one and was rightly laughed at by every other person in the room. Look, you can see why people might not be thrilled about David's latest appointment. You might also understand why him holding a life peerage after causing such an immense amount of damage to the country is a contentious subject. While his defenders might trip over themselves to say things like, oh, but he legalised gay marriage, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, I'm fucking bored of giving politicians a high five for making the choice to do the bare minimum in not being a totally morally bereft pig-fucking cunt. Let's not forget that over 300,000 excess deaths can be attributed to austerity policies. From starvation or a lack of heating to stripped back healthcare services, inflation, homelessness, they've all directly contributed to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. 
In the face of a crisis of capitalism, David Cameron chose to socialise the costs and allow the richest amongst us to just continue getting richer and richer. David Cameron's austerity created the environment that saw the UK totally unprepared for the Covid crisis. David Cameron chose to let more people die rather than tax the very richest in our society an extra 5% on earnings over 12 and a half grand a month. If that, in your estimation, is a man of morals, then I'd hate to see the kind of person you think is a complete cunt. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please do like it and subscribe, it really helps. A huge thank you to my gorgeous and intelligent patrons who made this video possible. If you'd like to support, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Love you. Bye bye.